Um, my name is Rachel Rudolph. I'm the uh, Extension Vegetable Specialist for the University of Kentucky. And um, we, tonight is going to be um, all about equipment and tools for small and mid-scale vegetable production. Um, and so we'll just jump right in here. This is a collaboration with um, Annette Wislacki at the University of Tennessee. So a, a few things to keep in mind, right? Equipment sounds very uh, obvious, right? But equipment really does matter. And sometimes it's a lot more complicated than we actually think, right? So what works for our neighbor may not work for us, right? And um, so just keep that in mind. Sometimes it's a trial and error, unfortunately. So because vegetable production is so labor intensive and often relies on a lot of hand labor for doing a lot of um, small tasks, um, repetitive small tasks with our, hand, with our hands, right? A lot of things, um, and we're also working with delicate uh, produce in most cases. Um, a lot of automation just isn't available unless you're on a really big scale, which for Kentucky and Tennessee is, is not really the case in, in, for the most part. Um, but the right tools are important for the success and the viability of the farm and the efficiency, right? So if you are using this tool to do this really important job and it's either hurting your back or hurting your hands or it always breaks or something like that, right? It, it really slows things down. And so equipment and tools are necessary for pretty much every aspect of vegetable production from seeding to harvest and then even on into post-harvest. So the factors affecting, um, uh, the factors to consider before a buying equipment, right, is your location, um, growing conditions. What are you, what are you growing? What, do, what, what are you looking for? What kind of, um, tools do you need to help make you more efficient? Uh, types of crops being grown, production practices. So um, are you, do you want to become more automated? Do you want um, larger scale? Are you going to grow your farm or are you going to stay relatively small? Uh, your market. So are you selling wholesale? Are you a farmer's market person? Are you restaurants? Are you, you know, direct to consumer? Um, that's also going to affect, to a certain extent, you know, going to be linked with the scale and your production practices. Um, can you pay for some fancy piece of equipment through your market, through your customers, right? Um, do you, are you going to have enough sales to pay for it um, and the volume of your business? Um, I'd also say that um, a lot of you have um, high, may have high tunnels. And that is something to keep in mind with what equipment's gonna work with your high tunnel, right? And so um, that's an important component to think about. So determining the right tools for the job can be trial and error, but there are a few characteristics that um, these tools should all have, right? So they should allow for efficient work, um, meaning that they minimize fatigue and they're ergonomic right? They fit your hand or they fit your, you know, if it's a backpack sprayer, right? It's comfortable on your back, that kind of thing. Um, it shouldn't be constantly hurting you. They should be safe to use, right? So something that, um, you know, every once in a while I come across a, a pocket knife. I, I lose my pocket knives, for example, kind of often. And it's always that, that next pocket knife that I'm going to buy, I'm always thinking about how easy it is to open and shut, particularly shut. The one I have now is actually not that easy to shut. And so I think about that, like I'm, I may cut myself at some point in the future trying to shut this knife. And so it's sometimes it's something as small as that, right? Like, is it easy enough to use that you're not gonna hurt yourself trying to get it to work every time? Um, light and easy to transport. In some cases, you know, the weight of something can't really be helped, but if you're using it a lot, um, either, can it be put on wheels? Can it be, you know, is there comfortable straps in the case of a backpack, right? Sprayer or something like that. Um, or is it light enough that you can deal with it? Um, ready for immediate use. So minimal adjustments that um, won't cost too much time and money. 
Um, sometimes, you know, older equipment, you really have to tinker with it and get it just right. Um, if you're borrowing something from someone, right, they have it set, just calibrated, just right for their stuff. And then you've got to fool with it to get it to work for you. And so that takes a lot of time and energy and, um, you know, time is money. Um, made readily available, made of readily available materials, right? So um, things that you can easily get your hands on. It's not going to be, um, I know we're dealing with that a lot these days, I know, but, um, you know, you're not going to be waiting for it for months on end to come back in stock. Um, durable, right? So if you spend money on something, you want it to last. Um, you shouldn't have to be buying a, a new trowel every season, for example. You know, those things, it's, it's nice to invest the money up front and then not have to deal with it again. So, okay, let's think of larger scale here. So um, you've got, right, uh, tractors of various sizes and you could have a mower implement on the back of the tractor or a disc implement um, on the on the back of a tractor, right? This would be large, um, me medium scale, right? Um, if you had multiple acres, even, you know, I would say above five acres, it may be really challenging to tackle those five acres with a walk behind tiller, right? So you may want to scale up, maybe not something this large as this disc, right? But you may want a an actual tractor with implements um, that, that can be pulled behind it, right? Um, and if you're going to be cover cropping um, or doing any kind of larger, you know, growing your, growing your farm, you want to be able to knock things down, disc them in, um, take care of that, the management. So here's more, you know, mid and small scale, right? So we'll walk behind rototiller. Here's a field cultivator. This is, um, can be really nice just for light um, weed work, for example. Um, so you kind of let a flush of weeds come through and then you, you come through with a, a field cultivator. You, once the weeds get, you know, much bigger than three or four inches, this thing does not work very well, but it's really great for, um, seed bed prep right before you're going to plant. So you've done the, the tilling and the disking already and, and you're almost ready to plant. Of course, the walk behind tiller, that is kind of the, um, for vegetable growers, this is our, <laughs> our go-to, right? Um, it works in a high tunnel of pretty much almost any size, right? And um, it can work, I would say, for a few acres of size. It's, it's a good um, piece of equipment. Um, it's also manageable for a lot of people. So ours is kind of hard to use. It's kind of heavy, but it's still easier to use, for example, than a tractor in, for many people, right? And it's also relatively affordable. Um, and they last for years. So um, the one I have is from, I think, the early 90s, right? So... Um, you spend money up front, take care of things, keep them in good condition, and, and they'll take care of you, hopefully. So soil prep, right? So all scales, again, we're talking about even small scale, um, right? You've got all these like rakes, shovels, pitchforks. The broad fork is a really great um, small scale, high tunnel um, soil prep. Uh, tool. So you stand on it. For those of you who are less familiar with it, you stand on it and you kind of just lift the soil. It's not meant, to, you're not meant to invert the soil entirely. Um, it's just to loosen that soil up. So in, especially in high tunnels, compaction can be an issue and um, you, you basically use your body weight on this, on this tool. Um, this tilter is a really cool um, little, so you can see here, there's a drill here. And so the cord is uh, attached to, um, operates the drill, you know, the button on the drill. And so when this drill turns, these tines also turn. So this is, you can kind of tell, this is really light soil work. It's good for just incorporating a little bit, just a little bit of soil disturbance. Maybe you're just incorporating a little bit of um, fertilizer right before you plant. It only goes about three inches deep at most. 
Um, and so uh, this one is, is really nice and it moves pretty quick. If your soil's rock hard, this is not the thing for you, but um, it can be a really great little tool, especially small scale, you know, high tunnel um, or, you know, a few acres. So some more field prep here. So um, we have several of these. These are very affordable, easy to use um, little propane um, burners. And then maybe the next scale up from that would be a tank with a hose and this handle. So this makes lovely, perfect holes in woven weed mats. This does the job, it gets the job done for sure, but those holes are not gonna be perfect um, in perfectly circular, right? And so, you know, if you're a little uptight, you want things to look just right, um, this would be more your way to go. If you're a get her done kind of thing, kind of person, then maybe this one is a little bit more your style. Um, so, and this is, these are the holes that I'm referring to. And the, the lovely thing about this woven weed mat, you can use it for several seasons. So you do this upfront work of making things look nice and measuring things out, these holes, these perfect little holes for a lot of um, different, you know, in this case, lettuce production. And then you can reuse it year after year. Um, it should be sanitized after the season, but um, it's, totally reusable and so you put in some a little upfront work early on and then you don't have to um, nearly as much later on. So field preparation, if you're doing plasticulture, so again for a lot of here in Kentucky for a lot of people that's kind of a step up is um, you know maybe moving from woven weed mat to um, plasticulture um, using plastic mulch. So this implement is pretty cool. This is a bed shaper, a plastic layer, and it also um, can apply fertilizer. So as you're shaping the bed, as you're, this box, you calibrate it to um, put in a certain amount of fertilizer per acre, pounds per acre, and it puts the fertilizer right in the bed, that raised bed, right? It's not a, so you avoid that broadcast situation where you're also fertilizing the weeds, right? And so, um, this is very, this is a, a great tool, but again, this is a, a, a bit larger scale, right? Um, you don't need a huge tractor to pull this thing, but um, it is um, basically a three in one piece of, piece of equipment. So transplant production. So um, my group uses a dibbler. Um, a lot of people, if you're doing a lot of one type of seed, the vacuum seeder is definitely a great investment. With my group, we're doing research trials and it's you know a few trays of this and a few trays of that, right? And so um, the vacuum seeder is not as useful. Um, the dibbler makes these great perfect holes in there, right? And, um, and then we just seed by hand, but with the vacuum seeder, seeder, it applies those seeds into those holes and um, it can really speed up transplant production. And it's, it's quite useful, but you do need to be doing quite a few trays um, to make it worth your while. The seed gets dumped in here and then a vacuum kind of creates this suction and the seeds get kind of sucked into these little holes and get um, put into the tray. Okay, direct seeding. So this um, Jang seeder also exists and you can do multiple rows at one time. They even have one that connect, you can connect multiple ones. So you could potentially direct seed um, multiple rows at the same time. Um, this is a great little seeder. Um, it's, it works the best um, for longer rows. So if you're gonna need to stop and start a lot, this is not, in my experience, this is not been super great for short rows. But if you're going to go like the length of a high tunnel, something like that, um, this is great. So you dump the seed in here and you can seed at different rates. There's little brushes that help 
um, help set make that seeding rate setting. And um, this, this can be super useful and it just drops between these blades here. And then the wheel behind it covers up the soil. So um, here we've got, you know, kind of the two scales of planting, right? So you could do direct transplanting uh, or transplanting using the water wheel setter, right? So these tines make holes in the beds and then you drop, as the tractor pulls you along, you drop those in. Of course, for smaller scale, the, the trowel is an amazing um, invention here and we definitely use that a lot too. Um, I would say for uh, using the water wheel, justifying that you would need to have quite a bit of um, area to cover. And again, it's most useful when you're doing a lot of one type of, of crop, right? So um, switching from you know, broccoli to tomatoes, you would need to switch these tines out because the distance is gonna be different, right? Your planting distance is gonna be different. So kind of judging what's, what's worth it, right? To hook up this thing and, and get it all set up or just um, get out there and, and do it uh, um, with a trowel. So weed management. So this is small scale weed management, right? There's all kinds of um, stirrup hoe and the wheel hoe, right? And then of course, just um, the square and the regular and the it's kind of shaped like a spade. Um, and then the, you know, these are small scale, um, easy to very finite. We want very clean, specific um, weed management in this case. And then um, here is a, a little bit larger, right? So you could use this thing uh, the same way, you know, with the um, weed mat, um, similar. This would be a better option than this or this, right? So both of these are on wheels. They're kind of, this one's a little bit more cumbersome. This one's um, pretty, pretty cool. You can just push that along. So again, these, the, if you're using any type of flame weeder, they really work best um, when the weeds are small. So once they get uh, over a few inches tall, you're gonna hurt the weed, but you won't kill the weed. And so that's really important of, um, you know, I think with weed management overall, um, timing and, and um, targeting the weeds at the smallest stage possible, that is really crucial to making your life a little easier. And it's also crucial to um, the efficacy of these tools, for example. Um, they just don't work as well if the weeds are very big. Okay, walk behind a walk behind mower, very similar to the, the rototiller. Of course, you can rototill to manage weeds between beds. That's always an option. Or if you've got some living mulch or some cover crop between beds, um, that's also, this walk behind is also a great option. So here you can see we have TEF. Um, two years ago, we do this um, for the most part with all of our squash production. We um, have TEF in the middle, T-E-F-F, -F, for those of you who are less familiar with that. And then um, we'll knock it down with a walk behind um, twice, two or three times in the season before the, the squash really gets to vine out. And it keeps the weeds at bay. This TEF is um, antagonistic to other weeds. So um, it, it, as long as you get the seeding rate right, it does pretty well. So pest and disease management. So sticky cards for, you know, people who um, are not going to be spraying or are not going to be spraying very much, you still need to monitor. And of course, scouting regularly is the best way to, to keep on top of the, the pests or diseases. Um, but specifically for pests, putting sticky cards up throughout your field or your high tunnel um, and, and checking them every few days, checking them once a week. Um, and switching them out. So sometimes I'll go to a grower's place and, um, you know, the sticky card is totally covered. And, you know, that's been there all, whatever, all season, right? So the sticky cards are most helpful when you've switched them out and you can keep track of, um, oh yeah, that's a new pest. Those, those sticky cards are only three days old and now, now it's got thrips all over it, right? 
um, that's when they're useful. Backpack sprayers. Um, there are so many types of backpack sprayers, different prices, and there's benefits and drawbacks to a bunch. Um, we have a pretty good video that I'll share with you at the end. I'll show you, show you the link um, to consider the different sprayers and the different types of nozzles. Um, so this, for example, this one um, is really handy for fungicides. It's really small droplets um, and it's fast, right? So it, it um, really disturbs the plants. And so you make sure to get good coverage because it kind of blows them around. It's kind of like a leaf blower in that sense. It's almost, it's very, very similar to a leaf blower and it blows them around. And so um, you get the underside and the top side and you really bl can blow through the plant canopy. And it's, it's really handy for that. Um, this, um, you can see, uh, you can't see the backside, but this is a CO2, um, it's a compressed air. And um, this does really well um, for insecticides. Um, it's slightly larger droplets um, than a fungicide, for example. Um, but you can control the pressure really easily. You can see there's a, there's a dial on it, you can see it. And so um, it's really, this one's really handy. This is just your standard backpack sprayer. Um, you know, something like herbicides, for those of you who would be applying that, this may be just the easiest thing to use. Um, you wouldn't want really fine droplets, right? You don't, for herbicides, you want large droplets that are gonna be applied in a very specific place, right? You don't wanna spray that around. Um, and so something where, you know, it's gonna be lower pressure and um, you can change out the nozzles really easily and, um, you know, control the droplet size. That's, that's the way to go for something like this. So this cute little pocket scale, it is genuinely, you know, about four inches long and maybe two inches um, wide. And it genuinely could fit in your pocket. Um, this is really great for our small scale growers and especially us for um, research activities. Um, where we just don't need a lot of pesticides. So we need a small scale, we need it handy. I don't wanna drag around a big scale to weigh some tiny amount of, you know, um, coside out, right? Some, some powdery substance, right? This is very handy. Um, so then temperature management. So I highly, highly recommend um, especially for people in who have high tunnels to um, utilize some sort of temperature relative humidity um, contraption, right? So this is a data logger. So, um, and I believe this, can, this one can connect to your phone. I'm not necessarily endorsing either of these brands. I'm just giving some examples. Um, this one is really nice because it's visual, right? Um, it's not recording anything. It would be, you go, um, into your high tunnel and you check it and you can see, right? Oh, it's 40 degrees, 40% uh, relative humidity. But this one would record things and um, there's plenty of options out there where um, you can connect it to your phone. And so you could check the temperature in your high tunnel or your greenhouse um, from a distance, right? And um, I think in the case of some of these, um, some of these you just need to make sure like the distance from your internet router to your high tunnel or wherever this um, device is gonna be is a certain, they tell you, right? It's like 700 feet or something like that. And so as long as your internet's not super far away, um, it works great. Um, so keeping that kind of thing in mind, something to keep, help you keep track of things and, um, you know, a, if you can record, that's even better. You can look back on things. If something happened, um, you can go back and, and look at the temperature and say, oh, did it get too hot or was it too cold? What was the temperature last night inside the high tunnel? Those kind of things. Um, fertilizer application. So again, this thing is, is wonderful for just applying um, a, a loose, I would say, you know, for a lot of organic growers, um, a natural or a biological fertilizer, you know, non-synthetic fertilizer, this kind of thing is great. And it incorporates it just kind of lightly um, for soluble, uh, water-soluble fertilizer, something this simple totally works. 
So um, this is connect, you fill this up with water and your soluble fertilizer, right? This is connected to uh, your, your, you know, one way goes to the spigot, um, the other way goes out into your drip line and you pressurize this thing and it creates a suction. Um, you open this up, right? And it creates a suction and, and you can fertigate that way. And it's, you know, you can basically make this, you go buy one of these things and, and the rest of this stuff can be purchased at Lowe's. It's, it's, um, it's quite, quite easy, quite straightforward. Um, you know, this is the next step up, I would say, or something like this, um, much more, um, you know, requires a lot more thought and um, th these dosatrons are a little bit more, quite a bit more expensive. This is something that they've created out at our research farm. So it's a mobile basically. So it's very similar to what I just showed you in, in this photo, but it's on a, it's on a wagon and can be pulled by a four wheeler. And so if you had multiple fields that needed to be fertigated, right, you pull this behind you and, and, and so it's a lot easier that way. So you're not lugging a heavy thing. Again, trying to keep things efficient and not, and, um, not break your back. Um, this is great for greenhouses and high tunnels. Um, you know, it's not necessary. There are much easier ways, but for, for greenhouse systems like soilless production, um, these two barrels are usually recommended the two different types of fertilizer, something like that. So irrigation. Um, drip irrigation across the board for vegetable production is recommended. I know this may seem silly, but honestly, I have so many of these things. Um, if you have one spigot in a really good location, you set up one of these hose splitters, I, and it has just really helped us keep track of what's being irrigated when. Um, of course, rain-fed irrigation is totally possible for high tunnels and also, you know, small parcels of land, quarter acre, half acre. Um, you can get that done through um, rain-fed irrigation. You just need to have the right setup. Um, there is, I'll show you a link to a video that discusses this in more in detail. So let's say you have this host splitter, and then I also highly recommend some sort of um, your uh, timer, especially for smaller growers, right? Um, and high tunnels, especially this, this, um, I don't know how many times, you know, people say, oh, I forgot, you know, I forgot to turn on the irrigation or something like that, right? So this is a, this is a backstop, right? You shouldn't just leave it and never look at it all season. You definitely need to confirm that it's still working. Make sure you put new batteries in at the beginning of every spring, something like that. But something like this is so great and so handy. So you keep your spigot on, right? The spigot's connected here and keep that open and on, and then it'll shut off um, as whenever, however you set it, right? Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 8 a.m. These, these three spots get irrigated. So you could have this set up to the splitter. And so two things are getting irrigated on this timer and maybe something else is getting irrigated somewhere else, right? Um, and so it's super handy. This is a soil moisture sensor. So, um, you know, you would probably need to change your, your, your setting every, you know, as, the, as it gets warmer, right? You wouldn't be irrigating the same in March or April that you would be in August, right? So monitoring your soil, this is connected to a watermark sensor and um, lights up when um, everything is fully irrigated and then these dots disappear if you if you don't if if it's um drier so this is a super handy um i think it's called a g dot i think it was created in australia but i'm pretty sure you can you can get it here we we have one of these they're they're very handy and, and it's a nice visual right you do need to set up the the watermark sensor appropriately in the soil and, and make sure that is um, accurate and calibrated. But other than that, this thing is super handy. Okay, harvest. It seems, um, seems really 
obvious, right? But first of all, I would like to say that we have a ton of different shapes and sizes for harvest bins. So what works for lettuce does not necessarily work for tomato, right? And so like these green bins, we have a bin, we have bins that are about half as tall as these green bins for tomatoes because they get heavy, right? And so, and you don't want a ton of layers of tomatoes stacked on top of each other. So we have more shallow bins for the tomatoes. So they're not only easy for us to carry, but you get some nice um, airflow and um, things don't get squished, right? Um, something like this is pretty good for um, lettuce, something light that if you put a bunch of stuff on there, it's not gonna get squished, right? That kind of thing. Or um, even this size is, is even better. It's a little bit more shallow, a little smaller. Um, but just keep in mind that, you know, you may need a, a few different types of harvest bins to keep things, um, to keep things the way you want them and to keep them fresh in storage and and not smushed and as high quality as you can possibly have them. So the difference between these two knives, right? So um, these are kind of your standard, what I would say is standard harvest knife. This is just a regular old knife that occasionally you know, somebody uses. This thing is so great. It's again, ergonomic. The handle is just right. Um, you don't need to saw at anything. You just, this, the edge of this blade, right? We use this a lot for greens and, and cutting things right at soil level. It's very quick and straightforward and it just keeps your, you know, your wrist from getting tired. So post-harvest, um, there is a lovely thing called a cool bot. It's fairly affordable. You can set the temperature, right? Oh, again, even in storage, have some, have a thermometer and maybe this would be even a better, potentially a better reason to have something that's recording the, the temperature, right? So if something goes wrong in the middle of the night, you can see it and you know, right? And there's a record of it. Um, keep things clean and um, spread out. And in general, right, a lot of our different, another challenge of tomato or of vegetable production is that, um, not a lot of our stuff have different storage requirements. And so keeping that in mind, um, you know, what works for tomato is not necessarily going to work for lettuce, that kind of thing um, is important. So season extension, thinking about um, my, so a lot of our growers here in Kentucky have some sort of backup heater propane situation. Um, my group has never used that. We have really thick row cover, like one and a half ounce um, row cover. And it's a, this, in this case, it's just one giant blanket that is about, I think, 36 feet wide. So it fits perfectly inside of our high tunnel over these hoops. And so it takes two people, really one person can do it by themselves, but it's nice to have a, another set of hands. So one at one end of the tunnel and one at the other end right and it's just one big one one big pull right with this this blanket then there are of course we also have several small pieces of row cover that are um, also super handy and if it's just you maybe the smaller pieces are a little bit more manageable if you don't have another set of hands to help you out um, but we really use the heavyweight stuff and um, we have we you know we plant tomatoes in mid March and we're okay. Um, I've, I've never needed the propane heater. Um, we always have plenty of row cover, and and we get by. Um, I know a lot of growers though have this as well, and so I guess it's maybe this is a little less work than um, if you've put the row cover on, then you've got to take it off, right? And so that's a chore, a bit a pretty big chore in and of itself. So here's some miscellaneous tools, um, just some things to keep in mind. So this kind of bucket um, tool box, I would say, tool bucket is super handy. We you know, keep, have a couple of these on hand and have some of your best tools, your most utilized tools in there. And um, 
So you can easily carry it around. You can keep it in the tunnel if you need to, that kind of thing. Um, lots of measuring utensils. So of course, label them. So, you know, no one thinks that this is for baking or for cooking, right? Label them appropriately. But having lots of different sizes, these measuring spoons, that kind of thing are really handy for weighing things out, um, measuring things, making sure you've got the what you need. Um, this stuff, I always find this kind of thing handy. And then I will, um, you know, we have a lot of different pruning shears. Um, these are my favorite. They are more expensive, but they have, they are the only ones that have lasted, to be quite honest. <laughs> so um, they've lasted now for about three seasons. They still, they're my go-to. And they're really great for suckering tomatoes, um, trimming back flowers, you know, harvesting flowers, really finite stuff. Um, these are great. And they, it is one of those things where when I saw the price, I was like, oh my gosh, that's outrageous. And I bought one pair and they're great. And so in some cases, you know, it, it, I would say it is the price does, I, I have several others that ha, um, were maybe a fourth of the price and are already busted and just went immediately in the trash after maybe a month of use. So I'm really weighing, weighing your options there and, and considering um, what's, what's worth, what it's worth and, and um, taking that into consideration. So this is the UK Vegetable Crop Research and Extension YouTube channel. So this has the um, rainwater catchment video. Um, it also has these different sprayer and nozzle videos. There's a lot of great videos on there. We're, we're still building it. It's still kind of new. So um, if people have suggestions of things they'd like to see, um, you know, we try to keep them fairly short. There are some presentations like something like this will be on there too. Um, but uh, take that into consideration. Um, then thinking of resources, understanding equipment costs on, um, this is a great companion piece to this presentation. Um, soil preparation video is also on this um, YouTube channel. Um, transplant production, for those of you that are um, growing, uh, trying to grow your farm and maybe considering, okay, I previously bought transplants from someone else. Maybe we're at the point where we should be doing our own, creating our own transplants, growing our own transplants, weighing those costs and um, the benefits of that. Um, UK, and maybe Tennessee has something like this too. Um, UK has a shared equipment directory. So there's different, um, Counties have different equipment that growers can borrow um, for a small fee. Um, and so this is basically a map of what's available in our, in our state. Um, I mentioned the uh, CoolBot, this low cost cold storage room for market growers. This, um, if you just put this in, this should pop up um, this number here. Um, and it's a fact sheet on that CoolBot. 